I'm back in plenary session, virtual edition. I'm joined by Jacob Hale Russell. He is an associate professor of law at Rutgers University. He is a former Wall Street Journal columnist. He is uh, joining us to talk about a new paper on masking, but more about elites and I think the pandemic. Uh, professor Russell, it's great to have you back. It's great to be back. Oh, well, boy, you know, I- Though really I shouldn't say that. Is it great to be back, no, right? A year ago, what I have said, we're going to have the same conversation a year from now. Oh, it's been a year, huh? Yeah. The last time we talked, I think, on this podcast has been about a year. And I hope it's a different conversation, but I think there are going to be a lot of the similar themes that we haven't learned from. Um, your new paper is out. It's in Tablet Magazine. And what's the title? It's The Mask Delusion. Mask Debacle. Debacle. It's a debacle. And it is a debacle. Total debacle. So I wonder, you know, we should at least cover some of the broad themes for listeners who haven't yet read it, but they have to read it because I think it's the best. And I've been tweeting up a storm about it because uh, I really do like it. Um, because I feel like all of the clues were in plain sight. You saw all the clues, you put it together, and you told the story of what actually happened. And I think that's a story that a lot of people don't even understand, but that's what actually happened. And um, I guess I'll maybe toss out a few things and then we'll go from there. The first thing, how it all began, I think people forget, but pre-pandemic, we had a number of randomized control trials in influenza on masking. They were generally negative, and that's why the consensus from World Health Organization and CDC in March of 2020 was, you know, don't mask. We just don't have that evidence. That's why Fauci went on 60 Minutes and said what he said. He was saying what was in line with the best evidence. And then you start the narrative there, and you start talking about the Masks for All movement, which is a movement run by someone without domain expertise in this space, but it quickly kind of took on propagandistic component to it. It quickly inter intertwined with elite politics um, and it took on a life of its own. So I wonder if you might pick up there, masks for all that those early months of 2020. Yeah, and I found it, I've, I've sort of wanted to write about them since, since then, but I think people weren't ready to hear it. And I think now we're at a moment where um, people are willing to, some people are willing to step back a little bit and say, whatever my position is on masking, the way we talk about it, the discourse is so broken and so, you know, so crazy and so extreme. And it's not just masking, right? It's every, as you know, it's every, it's basically every pandemic intervention, every way we talk about the pandemic, you're either in, you know, one, one extreme or the other, and there's no uh, sensible middle, even though I think most of us are, are sort of in that sensible middle. So I think Mask for All was a, a, a really um, telling example of it from early on. So um, like you said, it's sort of a citizen activist group, some scientists, but the, the person who spearheaded it was a um, artificial intelligence entrepreneur, Jer Jeremy Howard. And, um, you know, I don't know, I can't know what went through their, their mind, but they um, uh, said that they thought that, um, you know, cloth masks were probably a more effective uh, method than uh, than uh, the CDC and WHO and everyone else were saying, um, and they set about doing an evidence review. And so they they write up this evidence review um, that um, you know again I can't I can't prove that they had motivated reasoning, but my guess is they would not have published their evidence review if it had come to the opposite conclusion. And what they concluded was even though Cochrane and others had reviewed all the trials that existed, all the data, and concluded there was no good evidence, they concluded in fact there was good evidence and. The paper is one thing, but it just it's it was actually how they sold the paper outside the context of the paper that I think really struck me because you know within within moments, right? That should have led to a debate, right? We have two meta-analyses saying one thing, one saying another. Now we talk about what their methods are and how they're analyzing the different studies. Instead, they immediately started declaring that the science was settled. It was clear that masking worked. We needed to follow uh, not just masking, but specifically cloth community specifically that community uh, cloth, cloth yes. masking would reduce transmission and, and flatten the curve, um, and that, that there was no countervailing view. And, and what struck me was two things. First, um, and this has been a trend throughout the pandemic, the degree to which that kind of certainty and advocacy for a policy is immediately accompanied by a desire to do no further research. So it would be a perfectly sensible thing to say, we don't know what to do. This is a novel problem. We think the best thing to try is putting t-shirts on everyone's face for a couple of weeks while we study it. But instead, uh, you know, what we had consistently was people immediately declaring their solution on both sides, right? This is like a drug of choice for one side or, right. uh, you know, cloth mask and the other. Immediately, we're certain it works. We don't even need to study it. And uh, declaring that there was no, uh, you know, that it would be unethical to do a trial of it. Um, so, so shutting down research. And then I think also, um, 
the tone of the way the argument was pushed, I think mirrored a lot of what you, uh, you know, you and Jeff Flyer wrote about early in the pandemic, that anyone who didn't immediately come on board to community cloth masking was evil. They were a Trump supporter. They didn't understand science. They were a science denier. And, and there are examples of, of um, you know, I don't know Howard, but there are examples of him, you know, writing to the boss of one person who raised specific research related questions on on Twitter, Michael Osterholm, who's a, you know, a Biden advisor and, a, and a, you know, pretty hawkish on COVID, um, has a whole post about how Howard mischaracterized his views. And you saw this growing pressure campaign where first it got amplified in certain media outlets as the science is settled. And then a bunch of agencies didn't come around to it right away. And it was like, they immediately got called out by the press for being, you know, why are they so behind on the science? Why hasn't, uh, uh, you know, why hasn't the WHO adopted this obvious position and the, the kind of pressure campaign to immediately foreclose further discussion spread really quickly. And I think is a microcosm for what we've seen again and again, it's like we decide that a position is right. And then anyone who has questions or, or evaluates the evidence differently is bad and needs to be prevented from doing that. You know, um, and I want to push you on a little bit on this because I think, I mean, I, I think you're so spot on. We often talk about this as two things are happening. One, someone is trying to sell you something that still has residual uncertainty. And in this case, I'd say a lot of residual uncertainty. Because as much as I want to side with the original Cochrane analyses, I'll also say they had massive uncertainty bounds as well. We right. really hadn't done the sorts of studies we, would, we needed to do for the pandemic. In fact, actually, we'll end this pandemic. We'll have never really done those studies that we really needed to do. Um, so there's massive residual uncertainty. Enter Jeremy Howard with a very strong, certain point of view, the opposite of the prevailing wisdom. Um, and then so we say that you know one of the problems is that we're overselling the certainty. And then the other problem we talk about is the culture of science where instantly people are demonized you know, you're, you're heretical, you're a bad person, you know, it often has a very moral kind of component. But I guess what I wish to suggest to you, you know, and see what you think, is that that's just the nature of propaganda, like in, a, in the natural, in the selection environment of the human brain, the things that get, gain traction in the brain, couple a strong moralistic sense of what's right with an extreme punishment to anyone who doesn't hold that view. And that spreads like wildfire in human beings. And so in fact, if he had said, we're pretty sure, but also there's all this uncertainty, he wouldn't have had the same sort of mental traction. His, his propaganda, and I'll call it that because that's what it is, it is a type of propaganda, um, it wouldn't have spread as rapidly across human brain neurons and preserved itself. You know, it's like the greatest, you know, it's, it's almost like an, you know, an organism's preservation tactic to you know, invade and then build a shell, you know? And the shell is you can not even question the belief, which is of course uncertain. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, I, unfortunately, I think you're probably right. I, I, at the same time, um, you know, I guess where, where, that, where that leads me is that there's gotta be someone who, whose responsibility is to push back against that. It may in fact be, and I, so I thought a lot about, um, you know, why did people sell policies with such certainty at the beginning of the pandemic. And I generally start from the premise that most people are arguing in good faith. Even if I disagree with them, they're probably, I think the masks for all people were believed in what they were doing. I think it was a, uh, you know, I may disagree with some of their methods. I may have problems with their analysis, but I think that, that it was a good faith attempt they to believe help. It, and proof they believed it in the beginning, they certainly practiced what they preached. Maybe not that, today, but in the beginning they, they did. they continue doing so, yes. <laughs> well, some um, of them will, some of them will. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, but go on. Good we'll faith. See, look yeah. at all the photos of the. Yeah. Uh, yeah we'll, we'll come back. Right. Hypocrisy yeah. later. Um, so the you know, if people are pushing these extreme positions, and those are the ones that are likely to gain traction, which might be true politically, isn't it the job of say the CDC or the NIH or the World Health Organization to foster, even if it's not in the public. I, you know, to, to foster that kind of research and to say, right, you think about all the, you know, I, you at one point talked about um, the, the British success with trialing different drugs and the, right, like, it's it's someone's responsibility to do it. Sure, I, I get that, um, you know, in my perfect world, every New York Times headline would be like, you know, lots of uncertainty about lots of things and very long nuanced articles, but I, I get that that's not necessarily possible, but you need some, you um, institutional pushback from agencies that have sufficient power and independence and autonomy and responsibility to do it to say, look, we're going to go out and, 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 and conduct that. I think the other thing I would say is um, some people have said, look, the, the reason 
um, elites and politicians sold certainty wasn't just hubris. It was an attempt to reassure people. People were panicked. And so people needed reassurance and nothing is more, you know, nothing would be worse than having them come out and say, we have no idea what's going on, but we're going to, we're going to think about it. And they needed to project confidence. And I think there's something to that, but I guess I also think number one, we, there's a lot that we know about public health messaging, and we know that, that doing that can backfire and it has backfired. So there's a difference between um, uh, certainty and confidence. You can, you can project confidence without falsely claiming certainty. Um, that's, that's point number one. Point number two is if you really, if you were an expert or an, you know, a politician who said, gosh, I really don't know what the right answer is, but I'm going to go out there and claim, you know, claim something with certainty. Shouldn't you then also be doing the research to figure out the right answer? If you in fact know that it's, you know, uncertain, shouldn't you then go do the research? And so I think the failure to me is that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, well, we can talk up, there are so many points of failure, but um, I, see. I do think you're right about human nature, but we also design institutions to in an attempt to push back against that and to, right. to guard against that and to get other voices out there. And, you know, none of, none of it came out, you know, it was there. It's also, the pushback was there. It just was not where right? you couldn't say in polite company or on Twitter without being labeled misinformation right. or in the New York Times, you couldn't raise any of the doubts until, you know, January of this year, basically, the Times ran the first op-ed, I think, pushing back on school masks. And then it was like, after that, 20 op-eds in the next week in the Times, all saying the same thing. It's not like no one thought it three weeks before. It was that it was deemed unacceptable to project that uncertainty. And I think that's also a very unhealthy, it's not that everyone believed it, it's that people who didn't believe it were either self-censoring or, you know, afraid to say it or were, or were being censored. <laughs> Hey, I was ahead of the curve because I was in July last year and then Atlantic in September, but they they tried to they tried to they tried to stone me for that crime. Uh, but I knew it in the moment because I knew it early on the evidence was crap. Um, the one point I want to make to you is that you're absolutely right. The people who failed are not these people who got swept up in the propaganda. The people who failed are either the leaders of NIAD, Fauci, and Collins, either they understood the uncertainty. And didn't run a randomized control trial, which has been in there, which is their whole job. Their whole job right. they had the budget to do that. That's their job. And right. so either they understood the uncertainty and didn't do the trial, which makes them terrible leaders, or they didn't understand the uncertainty, in which case they are terrible scientists, because anyone who knew anything would have understood it's uncertain. And it reminds me of like um, you know, in times of drought in like the Mayan empire, we would have like an animal sacrifice. Um, you know, and, and that's the level we're operating on in 2021. That this is like, a, remember we had to like cut your own sock out and put the holes in. This was actually bought, I bought this at Costco, I think. This is a, this is a brand. And, it's better, and, it, and it, apparently it's better than a vaccine according to the CDC oh, according director, to, so right? <laughs> according to MMWR, it is a 55%. This is trash, this is, well, you can blow right there. Okay, anyway, but, um, and then, so that's one point. Um, and then I guess the other thing I was going to ask you to address, but I'll, um, was a line from your, well, your paper. I'll read it to you and then you can take it whichever you want. This is, I think, the key. Because I don't think Jeremy Howard had won the war, but he won it in one moment. And this is the moment you identify early on in the essay, the moment that I think it was over. It was just totally over and you couldn't talk about it for at least a year. I tried a little earlier, but you couldn't have or you shouldn't have. Um, quote, when Donald Trump casually denigrated cloth masks as president, the stage was set for a democratic backlash. And that was the moment, I think you're right, turning masks into not just a public health measure, <clears throat> but a talismanic symbol of virtue signaling on one side and a rallying cry about freedom on the other. Whether we like it or not, you know, people always discount this man. He is the most influential man in your life because when he says schools should be open, you, if you don't like him, you say they should be closed and you don't even look at the data. Your brain turns off no matter how smart you are. And if he says this is a face diaper, you say it is salvation from the Lord. You know, I mean, that's how influential his is. His influence is even making you take the opposite position without thinking. I mean, he's so influential. Well, remember early on, there were, there were several people who were saying, um, I think it was over um, hydroxychloroquine. They were saying, I hope the trials of it fail because it will prove Trump wrong. Yes. And what a weird thing to say that I, right? You could say, I think they'll fail, but to say, I want, I want this drug not to actually cure people just because I want 
Trump to be wrong. Jacob, I know Couldn't you actually I, want it to be? To I know doctors right. who were like telling me privately, it's the evidence is really promising. Look at that laboratory data. And you know, I always hate laboratory data. I was like, that's garbage in science. Um, but they were telling me privately. The moment he said it, they're like, they gave up on it. They're like, eh, you know, it don't work so well. Like their own mind is influenced by him. These are laboratory people, but go on. Okay, so so he had this campaign and Trump spoke and, and you identify this early in your essay as sort of a key moment. And I think we want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that has struck me since uh, since the beginning, I, you know, I, I full disclosure, I, I come to this like you from the political left. I've always, you know, I've left of left of many of the people I know, um, and uh, you know, from the early days, it became if you were a true liberal, you were, you know, pro lockdowns, pro masks, pro whatever, you know, pro any anti any drug Trump like, you know, anti the vaccine campaign because he was push. It was like. You had to choose your camp, and you couldn't carve out uh, uh, a nuanced view. And I think one of the things we know, because we have, you know, the Scandinavian example, we know that there is not an inherent association between liberal politics and the most uh, uh, um, um, aggressive oh, NPIs, right? Because Scandinavia is one of the more; those countries are among the more liberal countries in Europe, and they took a different path. So we know that there's not an inherent masks are liberal and not masks are are. Republican. It's not like an inherent truth. It's just what ended up happening. And once it happened, and I blame both sides for this. It's like once it happened, no one was ever going to change their position, right? It was a the, the greatest infringement on freedom. But not only infringement on freedom, but you know, it was depriving everyone of oxygen. So they were going to go brain dead on one side. And on the other side, it was a perfect panacea because it became partisan. And you and right, we know from Scandinavia, it could have gone in a different direction, right? It could have, if Trump had said, wear this mask, we'd be doing exactly the, the reverse. I think um, if Trump had said, wear this mask and little kids need to wear it more, more than adults, I think liberals would have been talking about how we just don't know if their language development will progress. We, did, we know kids need to see faces. I think literally entire organizations that are made of scientists would have put out statements in the opposite direction how chilling is that, that one man, a former reality TV show star who became president can get the AAP to take the opposite point of view. As a, I'm like, what is, I mean, that to me is, doesn't it speak yeah. to the malleability of elites or science? I mean, I think it also, it, I, I guess it speaks in part to, we, we sort of forgot that it's, but I, and maybe this is this is part of why I don't like the, the phrase. There are all sorts of reasons to dislike the phrase "follow the science," but one of the reasons to dislike it is it it took all of the um, kind of important philosophical questions, I guess you could call them, out of um, out of public debate because everything was just going to be you know study has proven X, study has proven Y, and I think there were a lot of right. What you would have wanted was people on the left to have a more philosophical debate. That on the one hand you know, conventional um, uh, progressives should should care a lot about protecting the most vulnerable and should, you know, should be willing to make sacrifices and to take on higher costs in order to protect them. But at the same time, right, that also has all sorts of questions about, uh, you know, the, the use of, of lockdowns, about, uh, you know, why we didn't increase other kinds of policies like, you know, sick leave or provide other kinds of incentives, right? It, it could have raised a much more rich philosophical debate about what it means to protect the vulnerable in a realistic way under COVID. And instead it became, um, uh, I think maybe because people on the left thought, well, we're just, we're, we're, we're being told we're following the science. This is what the science says. And we don't, we don't need any pushback, right? One of the things that mass scroll people, the advocates kept saying was there are no downsides, which is an absurd, I mean, I don't even know what that statement means because first of all, the, the policy is not masking of an individual. It's a mask mandate. And we know a downside of mask mandates is polarization, enforcement problems, anger, right? That's a downside. That Even is if a the downside intervention had policy. no downsides. But you know What's the that? intervention has downsides because every time <laughs> the every time they go on TV, you don't watch TV and everyone, if there was no downside, every TV show would right. be like this. Right. But they hold their yeah. breath when they take off their mask. So <laughs> yeah. you know. when they take a photo, I held my breath. <laughs> that was... um, you know, I, I don't even know what to say. I, yeah, I think the fact that people in good faith to this day offer there are no downsides. The other argument I think that's related is 
you know, people like me have said, you need to do a cluster randomized trial to prove it has a reduction in transmission in kids before, if you're going to do it for two plus years. I mean, at some point you got to pony up and show me some data. And they say, well, you got to pony up and show me some data that not seeing faces for two years is bad. I was like, that's not how life works. You know, right. the person who wants to deprive you of your sensory experience doesn't have the, you know, they don't, they don't, you don't have to prove to them that you need to see faces or have touch, have human touch and a human hug. And, you know, a mother should be able to hold her baby. You prove to me that a mother should hold, I've never seen a randomized study a mother ever needs to touch the baby you know that's not the burden of proof the burden of proof is if you want to intervene on people and take away things you prove it but it's it's also i think fundamentally not the question of how important is seeing human faces is not it has there is a scientific component right how important right. developmentally speaking is it for children to see there are there are scientific aspects to it but it's also it's mostly a social and cultural question and the idea that you would follow the science to figure out what the costs were when in fact the costs are not they're, they're, they're sort of moral and social costs. And it doesn't mean we would have come to a different position, but I think it means we wouldn't be locked in this rigid thing where I think for a group of people, there's no out that because if there are no downsides to, the, to this intervention, even if it has the slightest marginal benefit, you've got to do it forever. And in fact, there are downsides and different people could reasonably come to different conclusions about how much of a downside it is to not see faces, but it's not a question that we're just going to get a narrow scientific answer to it's a it's a human question i don't know why that just got shut out like we're not allowed to talk about that because because science says there are no downsides it was a I think a very weird and unfortunate side effect of the framing of a lot of these issues as being sort of purely um uh you know purely scientific and as having kind of one determinate answer that that we also happen to be certain about on day one right i mean if i were to this is a total speculation guess, but this is a guess that comes from reading a lot of these studies. If I were to guess what would have happened if we ran maybe 30 or 40 different studies in, in the summer of 2020, when we ought to have, what we would have found is that um, <clears throat> community-wide recommendations for cloth masking probably offers next to no benefit. Um, maybe there are some rare settings where you have short transient exposure to someone, such as a grocery store shopping, where a cloth mask might have had a very marginal benefit, but places where you have prolonged indoor uh, stagnant air exposure time to someone, all the air is going to circulate anyway, so office buildings and daycares, etc. I also think you would have clearly seen an age gradient that you know we all know like with everything in life when it's a behavioral intervention it works better in people who are more likely to button their their shirts and zip up their jackets appropriately so it might have worked in adults but at some age of children it probably wouldn't have worked and my guess would be something in the 8 to 12 year old ballpark is where we're going to look at some trade off even if there was a benefit i think we would have also learned that in some ultra high risk settings like if you're a line cook in a restaurant, N95 is like the only thing that would have protected you because you needed an N95, you're in this hot sweltering kitchen, um, you needed some sort of higher grade respirator or better ventilation might've been the answer in those kinds of settings where we know those, those kinds of populations, the real essential workers were like decimated. But we could have learned a lot of things. Do they work above or below some prevalence? Do some masks work and others don't? Do, you know, does it require, you know, we don't get prescribe everyone the same chemotherapy drugs because some people get cancer. You know, we could have had some sort of tailoring, um, but we didn't. And now we end up in this intractable situation where one year after a mass vaccination campaign, we are still continuing to mask in so many places. And putting on more masks. More masks and, and, <laughs> and, and thicker and stiffer masks, you know? Um, you know, I, every, every additional booster I get, I got to wear a better mask. It doesn't make any sense. Um, let me read you something you wrote and have you respond to it. This is, I thought, brilliant. Um, the ability of masks to impact the outcome of a pandemic, like most interventions, is in fact a complex question. The discourse has been framed unhelpfully and meaninglessly as masks work versus masks don't work. The theoretical value of an intervention in a vacuum is not the same as its real world effect. While studies of aerosol unmasked and mannequins may tell us something about fabric quality, they do not tell us much about the effect of a mask mandate, the actual policy in reality. Wonder if you might separate those two. I mean, I think that was the, this is, the, this is why the physicists and the aerosolists and the artificial intelligence entrepreneurs, they don't get it. They don't get that policy and the fabric there's something in between called people, you know? Right, and I think, so I think, you know, you you heard, you still, amazingly, you still hear it in 2022, people saying some version, if everyone just stayed home for two weeks, this would, and so let's, let's take that seriously for a second. Even imagine that that was, true. imagine it was factually true. There were no animal reservoirs of COVID, what, you know, and we actually could stay home for two weeks somehow, and it, like it was literally possible, and it would, you know, it would end COVID. It's still 
not a not a viable or valid policy because it will never happen, right? Someone will not comply with it, and you can't actually do that on a global scale, even if hypothetically there were no animal reservoirs and it would work. And so I think you see a lot of people who who think of the um, it's like the implementation problems with policy aren't their problem. The, the, you know, they design policy in a vacuum and then it's a moral failing of people not to implement it. But of course, you know, policy includes people and it includes the way they're going to react. Um, and, you know, on top of that, I think it's, it's not just that we, um, you know, now we blame it's, it's the fault of the anti mask you know, COVID would be gone, but for the anti-maskers. It's not just that that's not a helpful or, 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 you know, a good way of thinking about policy, but also we've done a whole bunch of things to turn more people into anti-maskers by turning it into this, right? And this is, goes back to this, the, the work that Julia Marcus did early on, on, on you know, blame and shame. It's not effective to blame and shame people. And so you simultaneously have a policy that assumes all of the problems are about non-compliance and then does everything humanly possible to alienate the non-compliant so they'll continue not to comply. And I, I think this, this, this sense that you don't have to think of policy in a real messy world and all of the different consequences it will have, it's the same thing I, I think goes on in the costs and benefits language, right? I mean, we, I think what they meant when they said masks don't have a cost, I don't know what they meant, but I think what they meant was to the individual wearer there is not a health cost associated with short, like basically you're not gonna be deprived of oxygen if you wear a mask. Right. I think that's what they meant, but it fails to consider the policy in a, in a broader lens of what it does to society for two years to not see faces and to think about off ramps based on that, right? It doesn't, it doesn't put it in, in a real world context. It's, it's, it's instead imagining that everyone is a mannequin in a lab by themselves, and what would this what would this do? I think the, the other thing that it, it it raises for me is that things just quickly get with the, the the paragraph you read the you know masks work versus masks don't work right. goes back to what you were just saying about if we had done these trials, what would we have found? There has been no ability to carve out a middle ground. Right. You get shouted out if you have a middle ground position right. on masks. Either you think they're the greatest infringement on freedom ever and should be illegal for someone to voluntarily wear it, yeah, volunteer. or <laughs> kids have to wear it two yeah. N95s outdoors at recess, yes. even when they're six feet apart. And you yes. can't say, gosh, there might be some settings that are high risk and lower downsides and other settings, right? So you couldn't take the position. I mean, it, with masking of children, there might be differences between masking two-year-olds, which nowhere else on the planet does, and masking eight-year-olds. But we've had no ability to have any nuance about that because then you become an anti-masker who must also, you know, want to take masks away from everyone. And so I think the 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 it, you know it sounds pedantic to say really what we should be saying is mask mandates have you know, benefits that temporarily exceed the cost that we're going to study. It sounds pedantic to say that's better than masks work, masks don't work, but it, it actually matters because we've reduced everything to these binary extremes. And I think a lot of people who come from this kind of, um, you know, I think where, where you and I and a lot of people are the, the misunderstood middle where you can't get a word in, in, in edgewise because we've, we've painted everything into these two uh, uh, polar opposites. Yeah, that's so well said. Um, and the other example I think of as a, like, just a classic example of how it's more than just the message, which is like, a lot of these people should know better. They're doctors and they counsel people about weight loss. You could tell someone, here's, here's how you lose weight. Just don't eat anything. Just don't eat anything. Just eat a, you know, carry a bag of carrots and eat a two carrots a day. And you, I promise you, you'll lose weight. And then if you don't, if you don't lose weight and then you come back to my clinic, am I going to say, you just didn't follow my orders. I gave you a surefire recipe. We understand with weight loss that the diet has to also be sustainable. It has to keep you have some satiety. You know, it has to actually be something you can do and is live with and go to dinner parties and go to your grandmother's house and still, you know, follow like it has. To, and that's why it's hard. You know, that's why it's hard. And so somebody who sees that day in and day out says, you know, it would just be real simple if these toddlers would mask up for eight hours, you know, it was go away. You know, it's like, come on, you, you, you deal with a problem you understand. Um, Although famously, there was that the press conference where Governor Cuomo, who at the time was still revered by by, by many people, uh, said his famous line where he said, you know, it's, it's people are getting sick. It's their fault for not wearing masks, just like the people who eat cheesecake. You know, the, the people who are fat, it's because they eat too much cheesecake. So, in fact, he actually 
takes the, the same view on on the dot. He is philosophically consistent. It's, At least I get, yeah, you know, and I actually saw somebody recently write an op-ed and they said that the WHO should change their policy and recommend two-year-olds wear masks. And I, and I got a lot of criticism online, but I actually gave them points because they're actually consistent. You know, the rest of these people, they're like the ones who want to be inconsistent. But this person was like, oh, well, you should be wearing, you should be masking your toddlers too. <laughs> so, okay, I wanted to, um, well, I, I want to read you some, well, maybe I'll say the one thing I wanted to say first. I actually think there's fundamentally a, a, the January 2021, January through May is a different moment when it comes to masking. Because let's say even for the sake of argument that some of these mask policies actually slowed the spread of SARS-CoV-2. I think that that is a desirable goal before you can do disease modifying therapy. What do I mean by that? There's only been one major therapy that fundamentally, I mean, there's maybe the pills, but they have a very modest sort of contribution. But the one fundamental disease modifying therapy is vaccination. Vaccination modifies your risk of bad outcomes a lot. You know, even in some of these series to date, we're still talking about, I don't know, I don't want to get too technical, but there's conditional probability estimates of 60 to 80%. But basically, even if I'm to get a breakthrough SARS-CoV-2 infection, which I will inevitably get a breakthrough, by virtue of being vaccinated, I will have a much lower chance of being hospitalized or dying. Um, and what else can I do to lower my risk of bad outcomes when it inevitably breaks through? I, I could have lost weight or maybe get some better sleep or maybe you know take better care of myself, lower my blood pressure. I hope that I've personally done those kinds of things, um, but you know, different people do that to different degree. That's the messy part of human beings, but the vaccine is something easy people can do that maybe has a log fold reduction in risk of death when they eventually get breakthrough. So prior to the mass vaccination of adults, prior to May, 2020, where really everyone who in America who wants to do it can do it, Prior to that, I think you can say society has an obligation to pursue policies that delay the time until you meet it the first time, because maybe we can do something in the middle to substantively lower your bad outcome. And so there's a benefit from that. But the moment you get beyond into the summer of 2021, where we have made it widely available, and there are some people who are going to come to it eventually, but you know, it, it is, you know, we've done pretty much all we can. We've encouraged it. There's so many different campaigns. Um, I don't even want to get into the mandates yet, but you know, we've done our best. It's available. You can you could trip on a you could trip and fall into a CVS and get a shot, you know, if you wanted to. Then I think the obligation of the society, even if this worked, um, needs to be reassessed. What is the what are you actually accomplishing? You're merely delaying the time until the inevitable breakthrough. Maybe if this worked, I'll get my breakthrough um, in December instead of September. But I'm still going to get my breakthrough because I think by the fall of 2021, it was abundantly clear vaccine effectiveness against um, breakthrough was was rapidly diminishing. And and now I think it's clear that you know we're all going to get a breakthrough, and we're going to keep getting breakthroughs, and we're likely to get you know seven breakthroughs the rest of our lives. But the good news is you know, the first will be the worst and the other ones will be milder, um, at least until we get too high in age. Um, so I guess what I wanted to say on this issue is that um, I think that one of the ways the train derailed was the administration coming out in the summer when they got spooked by Delta and saying, well, now all the vaccinated people got to get wear masks again, because then it created a situation where I wasn't clear what even the goal was. Like, you know, even if it, even if they believed it worked, they certainly can't believe it works forever. I mean, they can't be so delusional to think its effect size is 100%. It's got to be, you know, 15, 10, 10% 10 like Bangladesh. Uh, second of all, what, 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 what difference am I going, you know, what can I do differently? And third of all, it just took away any off ramps. There's no theoretical off ramps ever. So now, like, why not every winter we all wear masks for in perpetuity? Um, they painted themselves into a, into a corner that cognitively makes no sense. Um, okay, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that I, a bunch of things come to mind. I mean, one is the way in which I think that the the that the the, the switch in uh, in messaging after mass vaccination, I think, is a good example of undermining public trust because I think we effectively had a a, a social contract on the terms you said, right? The idea was, and I don't know that everyone could have spelled this out, but more or less the idea is we're going to take great steps to delay infections for the benefit of everyone. And then we're going to go get this vaccine and we're going to you know, be the first in line to do it. And then in exchange, we're going to stop doing some of those things. I think it was part of a, a, a social contract. And I think it got it got violated at the point that, uh, uh, you know, the CDC reneged on on that. And um, I, I guess I, I also just think that that part of it is, you know, kind of comes back to how things were sold at the beginning. I mean, you said um, you, you were just making the point about how we're, we're all probably going to get it. And it's, it's not that that's not a totally surprising fact, right? I remember Mark Lipsitch, like it was like 
before the pandemic even came to the U.S., he wrote this piece in the Atlantic where he said, we're all going to get COVID. It's right. going to yes. like, it's what's going to happen. Now, could he have been wrong? Certain, like, sure. Right. And he acknowledged uncertainty, but there was at least a plausible reason to believe that we were probably all at some point going to get it. And the best we could do was to let, you know, flatten right. the curve and delay it. So there was a pretty good hunch that we were all going to get it. And yet what we sold was this idea that if you got it, it was a moral failing and that it was also that, you know, the, the, you know, the, if you look at the statistics on how much, where people think, how, how lethal people think COVID is on the left, right? I mean, they massively, people on the right underestimate it, people on the left um, overestimate it, but we painted it as this moral failing. And now I think you have a group of people who can't conceive the idea that they will get COVID is inconceivable to them because from day one, they've been told it's a moral failing if you get it and you'll die. And so now even that they have vaccines and are, are double boosted or whatever, they th th they were sold this messaging, which made no sense at the time, because if it, if it was at least conceivable that we were all going to get COVID and that its end game was gonna be endemic, you need to prepare people for that psychologically. And is it good preparation if you're telling them anyone who gets it is a bad person who's you know not followed the rules that they've eaten too much cheesecake and they got their COVID because they did something wrong. It was a, a bad way to sell it from, from the beginning. And I think it created a very warped social contract that no one can, no one can really live up to it. And I don't know how we, how we get out of it because of that. Oh, that's really, really well stated. Um, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think that that's, that's the root of it. Um, a warped expectation, warped social contract. And it, it will have, I mean, some of these people, I don't think they're ever coming out. Um, let me read you another line that I thought was just brilliant. Maybe this is the last one. I'll read you from your essay. Uh, then we'll talk more broadly. But I thought it was just so good. Uh, quote, mask mandates are just one of many pandemic policies. A similar disregard for curiosity and open debate have pervaded other areas like lockdowns and booster policies but they offer an object lesson in how overconfident, unnuanced messaging conditioned us to assume that all dissenting opinions are misinformation rather than reflections of good faith disagreement or deferring priorities. I could not agree with you more. And um, you know, we can you can you can talk more about the lockdown, just talk about the vaccine policy. For me, in my mind, we quickly split on vaccines where you're if, if you don't get a booster in your sleep based on a press release that are based on Albert Borla whispering in Fauci's ear. If you're not willing to commit to that right now, that you're going to get your 27th booster when Borla whispers to Fauci, you ought to do it. You're an anti-vax, anti-vax, science denying, anti-GMO, you know, whatever you are, you know, uh, person, horrible person, parasite on society. I mean, that's the way they portrayed it. And to me, when I looked at the data, you know, like for me, I, like uh, I, I was very quickly sold on adult vaccination. You know, you, it wasn't a hard sell. Uh, I understood the lethality and I understood the, tri the trial data, Moderna and Pfizer data. So it was, great, it was easy. But I also understood that you had like a log gradient. And then as you go down and risk, you're following precipitously. And this gradient is huge. And so I knew that as you get to younger ages, that balance is going to be a little bit more, uh, require some judgment. And I still am rather convinced that, you know, for someone who is, Never, don't have natural immunity, that that first dose is probably benefiting almost everybody. I mean, you get a good reduction in hospitalization from that first dose. Um, but then the moment I saw myocarditis signal, safety signal, that's when I started to say, hmm, let me put a pin in dose two. Uh, does dose two make sense for everybody? Does it make sense for a 16-year-old boy? And then, uh, and then I also put a pin in, like let, when I started to see evidence about natural immunity and protecting you against repeat hospitalization, I said, let's put a pin in people who've already had the virus and overcame it, because you know, how many doses do they really need? Um, and then I understood that the fundamental structural bias in biomedicine is that the company will want to give them as many as they can give them because that's their market share. And I understood that a lot of people may think that that's good, but it's the job of independent scientists to say, well, prove to me that each additional dose improves a clinically meaningful outcome. And that's like actually getting really sick with this virus, not swabbing your nose and finding fewer, you know, nucleotide sequences. That's not clinically meaningful. Um, but what you saw, I think, is that there's been no ability to even have this debate. I mean, the only mainstream journalist I know who's even done it is David Zweig, and he did it on Barry Weiss's Substack, which is already two degrees of, you know, trying to get a little bit outside of traditional media. The traditional media won't even do it. The CDC keeps publishing study after study that are really just fundamentally flawed to support their strategy. There's not an ounce of criticism in the, in the, in the, in the media. 
Um, and then the one guy who occasionally stumbles onto something that is, I think he has a point, Rogan, you know, a lot of things I think he doesn't have a point. I wrote an article about that, but some things he does have a point like this booster and myocarditis stuff. Um, now they want to exterminate him, you know? Um, so talk about this, this broader sentiment, and you can maybe even talk about lockdowns, curiosity, um, how it's so important in times of uncertainty and how we've just extinguished it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, it's absolutely right that it's, you know, you, you have to take an extreme position. There's no middle ground. So you have a question about, and it's the same thing as masking, right? You, you, if you opposed masks for uh, two-year-olds, it would mean you were an anti-masker for everyone, right? There are no middle positions. If you question lockdowns, it must mean you want to let the virus rip and kill everyone, right? There's no um, uh, ability to say, look, we're taking a middle ground position, which is particularly ironic in light of the fact that a lot of these positions that get labeled misinformation or anti-vax or whatever are mainstream positions taken by Europe. I mean, it's like you take the EU position on something about boosters or whatever, and it's like you're now an anti-vaxxer. Right. So it's it's a it's it's weird. Um, I don't know. I guess I think it's it's I I guess I see two you could call them like habits of mind that we've been taught during the pandemic that I think you need both of them to get to the messy situation we've got. So the first is this lumping where there's no middle ground position. Everything is extreme. You're either, you know, 40 boosters for everyone or an anti-vaxxer. You're either five and 95s outside or burn all the masks and don't allow t-shirts because they might get turned into masks, right? These, you, you have these lumping in extremes with no intermediate positions. And then the second habit of mind is the assumption that those who disagree with you are doing it because they're bad faith actors, because they're they're evil or they're paid off by the, you know, some side. And I actually think if you had extreme positions, but you didn't have that assumption of bad faith, we might get to a different place. Because if you take two people with extreme positions, but they can recognize that the other person is coming from a place of good faith, then there's the possibility for compromise because they realize there's no other option. We both want the opposite thing. We're both coming in to a place of good. We're, we're not going to convince each other. So let's find a reasonable middle ground compromise. Or you might say, well, we have this intense philosophical debate. Let's settle it by doing some research. Let's go do a randomized control trial and figure out who's right. And then we'll answer it and we'll agree to go along with the person who's right. And I think the mix of polarized opinions plus this assumption of, of the other side always being in bad faith. And, and I mean, you see it all over Twitter, where on both sides, people just, it, you know, it, someone grifter, questions grifter, masks grifter. in schools, you're they're paid off by the Koch brothers, right? Yeah. Like, you know. But everyone's calling everyone a grifter. You're a grifter, yeah. and you're a grifter, right. and you're a grifter, right. and you're, uh, right. what the hell? Everyone's a grifter? Some people are true believers. Come <laughs> right. on. Well, and, and particularly because many of the people who hold the views they have are holding views that are consistent with what they have been saying for years on other issues. So we know that, like, we know it's a philosophical view. And so if we started from a sense that, you know, maybe not the people at the extreme extremes who are, you know, possibly unreasonable, but that, you know, people who have strong views on one side or the other are actually in good faith, then, then we might be able to, we would be forced to come to a middle position. But if you think the other side is actually evil and arguing in bad faith, you have no reason to engage with them. To tr you don't even want, there's no reason to even prove them wrong because yeah, I'll give you an example. they're evil. There's um, just like yesterday or two days ago, you know, there's a um, a very thoughtful primary care doctor, you know, in Washington D.C. and um, and uh, and 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 she, you know, she she has uh, has children and she's talked about that publicly. Um, and uh, she works in a practice, and you know, she's also somebody who thinks that we need to try to take some of these restrictions off kids because they don't face substantive bad outcomes, and that these restrictions are hurting their mental health. You know, okay, reasonable person. You know, and then I have to read like a long thread about, you know, like um, how much money her family has and where her house is. And I'm like, come on, this is so dis. I mean, I felt dis. I really felt sick to my stomach reading. And there were photos that of the house, weren't there? There was like, the, who is the architect too? I mean, oh, it was, there was yeah. disc description of the house. There was yeah. screenshot maps yeah. of like the neighborhood. Right, of where the kids were. Yeah, it was where the, yeah. ki and, where, and, where and, the kids were in school, right? A, a map of where the kids were in school. Yes, and then Twitter safety had deleted two of those things with the map saying that that violated the uh, harassment policy, but they didn't delete the rest of it. And they left the, uh, they left the user allowed to permit the con an anonymous user on the website. But to me, I mean, I found the whole thing despicable. But the thing that really, that really sickened me, like the people who are like professors, who I even know some of these people, they're like amplifying this and like, 
they're talking about like, you know, that this person has no right to comment and assuming all the things you talk about. I'll put a few things in that same bucket. One, everyone always assumes the other person is bad faith actor. And I think you're spot on that there may be a few extreme people who only exist in the online world and not in the real world who may in fact be bad faith, I, you know, uh, emoji, emoji. Um, but, 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 but there are a lot of people who are professors, who are doctors, who are real people in the real world who have been, pra- who are consistent with their philosophy. They're not bad faith actors. And then the other sort of tactics that I think are common these days are, um, you know, I always see them say they're like, oh, uh, I'm not linking. I'm not linking to the thing. That's bad. I'm not going to link to David Russell. I'm not going to link to, sorry, to Jacob Russell's essay. I'm not going to link to your essay because- I'm not going to amplify this dangerous misinformation. Yeah, right? I'm not going to amplify it, but I'm going to say it's totally wrong, even though I will never actually allow anyone to read the other side. And, you know, I was like, is that what intellectuals do? Like, I never I, I never read a book growing up where it said, you know, uh, and this is the passage that's, that's, bad, that's bad and it's redacted. You know, it's like, come on, that's not how scholarship works. You have to allow the person to read it and be persuaded. Um, and similarly, the screenshotting and all, I mean, it's just um, making it about people, not about issues. I think these are all part of the same thing. And, oh, and then the canceling speech, you know, somebody I know, their grand rounds was nixed, um, you know, because there were some comp- complaints, you know, what is the complaint that, you know, uh, I disagree with this person on some issues. Therefore, I should not be, I, I and no one else should ever have to hear from this person ever again, because I disagree with them on some issues. And the irony is, this was like a Bay Area controversy. These people are aligned on like 95% of the issues in the world. You disagree on 5%, but you agree on 5%. There are people out there that d- they disagree with you on everything, but you won't, you don't even want to talk to someone you, you disagree with 5%. These are all cultural forces that we're living through that is just, I, I just want to call them one, they're poisonous. They're weak. I think they're weak and the people who hold them are weak. And I think the people hold them who are weak to some deeply in their core, they know they're weak. They know they can't compete on the basis of argument. And so the only way to shield yourself um, is to have these tactics. They also, I think, self-perpetuate in a system. They have a selection pressure, just like the virus is, you know, a virus that that replicates highly in the upper airway that spreads very quickly is going to have a selection advantage. These kinds of tools have selection advantage. And the people who I blame, this is the last thing I'll say, the people who I blame, it's the administrators. You know, for years, we have been putting the people in charge of these universities, the deans and presidents, and we don't pick people who are real scholars, whoever pushed the boundaries in any field, we pick the yes men, the, the kiss ups, the sycophants, the people who play politics, who they're, you know, you don't even know where they stand. You don't even know what they believe in. Um, we pick these people and we promote them because, you know, that job is really a middle manager. And then when they're faced with the students protest, they have no, they have no principles to go to. They don't even believe it. I don't even know if some of them believe in free speech or academic freedom. I don't think they even believe in it. And they have no, when you have no principles and you're just a yes person, um, you know, you'll go wherever the mob blows you. Uh, and if they want you to, you know, throw the first stone, you'll throw it. And, and they're the ones who are allowing this to happen. They've allowed, I think, canceling of lectures and all this stupid stuff. I mean, they need to put their foot down and tell these people, you come into my office and you want to cancel a, a grand rounds invitation that's been extended. Um, to a full professor of this university, I'll tell you what, go to hell. I was like, uh, I said, I hope that the students in this university, we are training students so powerful that if you think she's wrong, you want to cancel her like her grand rounds. I think, you, I hope that you're so good that you can defeat her message in the town square, but you don't want to defeat her message in the town square. Are you, are you weak? You know, you want her to just not be able to speak. So anyway, I'm alluding to something, but um, uh, you, you get the point. So I don't know. This culture, isn't this the problem? Yeah, I, I, so much, so much we could say about that. I mean, the, the the I think it all comes back to this pervasive sentiment that speech that I disagree with is dangerous, yeah. and like instead of having to engage it, s, you know, and ar- engage the arguments, I attack the person. Right. So we have all. I mean, and I, you know, if someone on Twitter, some random person on Twitter wants to do it, as long as they're not you know, posting photos of someone's house, which is creepy and beyond the pale. But if some random person wants to do ad hominem attacks, fine. But if you're an academic, I think you have a job to challenge the arguments of the other person, not, uh, you know, not just to uh, attack their reputation or make. So, you know, I think this goes back to the to the, again, to the beginning of the pandemic with the um, John Ioannidis op-ed in in Stat News. I mean, you could disagree with all, you could, you could, complain about all sorts of things about the op-ed, some of which I think have been mischaracterized, but you would have plenty of complaints about the op-ed, but the notion 
that he wrote it because he was somehow paid off by like the JetBlue founder or whatever, you know, who donated $4,000 to Stanford once. And like, is, I mean, it just, it doesn't even make sense. And there was a whole, like, I, there are a lot of people who now, as soon as he is mentioned in any context, immediately, you know, reply with the BuzzFeed article about how he's just a, a you know, a pawn of, of JetBlue. And the irony is that, you know, whatever you think of the merits of his argument, what he, what he is saying is so consistent with what he said was we need more data and we make bad decisions when we intervene quickly without data, which is something he's been saying for, you know, 30 years. You could disagree with it, I guess, but to say that the only reason he's saying it is because he's paid off is just, I don't know. I don't know if, if people actually have come to believe it because we've, we've, that's what I would like to know. I would like to, you know, some of the people on, on, on Twitter who are, you know, real serious scholars who are making ad hominem attacks and saying, you know, uh, anyone who wants to take masks off in schools is a Coke is funded by the Koch brothers. Do they, do they actually believe that? I think they may actually think that everyone who disagrees with them is getting a paycheck from the Koch brothers, which I think would be a disappointment to a lot of those people who say, where, you know, where's my check that I haven't, haven't gotten this check yet. I don't know. Do they actually, like, can they really not see that the people have a, four buckets. just disagree? Yeah. Right. Four buckets. Okay. And I'll be totally honest. Yeah. Okay. I hope no one's listening. <laughs> no, <right. Exactly. laughs> okay. Number one, I think some people, especially with John, um, but also a few others, but especially John, some people, they saw an opportunity that this guy has taken a dump on them for a lot of years, a lot of years. And it's like, you know, we all yeah. want that moment to stick it to him. Um, and how did he take a dump on them? Like, say, for instance, somebody has been working in a field publishing garbage research for their whole career, which is a lot of people, to be honest. And then one upon a time, he was invited to be the editorialist and he wrote an editorial. And it was so, it was just so painful because like you knew as I was reading this editorial, I was like, oh, not only is he like dismantled this guy's particular paper he's commenting on, but he basically shows that everything the guy did for 20 years is a waste of time. Okay. So, you know, that person's out for blood. And, and, and I actually saw one nice instance where I know John wrote the editorial of this guy's paper and took a crap on him. And then that person had them long thread about how I'm, I've disappointed with John. And, you know, he's like, let the whole field down. That's one group. Two, career envy. This is a strange business because our careers, I think, are at rather, I mean, I don't know if anyone realizes, but, you know, they're like, oh, professor, such a swanky job. I was like, mm, you know, it's, 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 it's okay. You know, I mean, yes, you have plenty of time to think and that's the best part, but you're not, you know, no one's getting to be, no one's a billionaire and, uh, you know, you're not getting, you're not, I'm not making a million dollars a year. Nobody's making real money, um, you know, and in medicine, I know a lot of people make a million easily because I know a lot of people practice and that's an easy way to do it. Um, so, I mean, I don't think people are doing it for the money. Um, uh, but despite that, you know, what's that thing? The, st the academic politics is the most nasty because the stakes are so low. So there are people who I think are very jealous. And there are a lot of people who work in a space who see, look at this guy's publishing, you know, 70 papers a year. And, you know, John has been for many years. Um, what they don't realize is they think there's some gimmick. There's no gimmick. I've worked with him. The dude is like emailing you back. You know, this was 10 years ago when I worked with him on a couple of papers. He's emailing you back at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. He's just He's, crushed, he's just working hard. He's just a hard worker. He's motivated by something. You know, it's, there's no secret to it. He's like, yeah, some people, this is a very competitive business. And I love how everyone talks about work life balance. It's like, well, it's a very competitive business and you can have all the balance you want, but some people are going to hustle because that's the business. That's the business. What do you want? Just like competing in the Olympics. You think they're not hustling, waking up early? They're hustling. That's the game. All right. So you don't like the game? You know, I'm making a new game, but this is this game. So whatever. Okay. He's hustling. This other jealous. The third group. I think are true believers. There's some people who I think like they're like in their house and they're scared. They think they're going to die. Um, some of that might be real. Some might be anxious. The more I ever learn about the true believers, I often, people always tell me things that I wish I didn't know. Um, you know, they're often like, you know, going through a divorce or, you know, having a medical health problem or something's going on with one of their kids. And so I have a lot of sympathy. The more I learn, like I can get why some people feel um, hurt. And then they, the, and then they, but, but I think the, the mistake is they're using their academic gravitas to kind of, um, to, to, to enforce their personal anxiety, which I don't like. And then the fourth group, Jacob Russell, my fourth group, the followers. I think we've created a mountain of followers. And, you know, I think that like everyone, um, everyone wants to be heard, but not everyone has something to say. And like social media has created this world where, you know, I, I look every day on social media. So everyone wants to be an influencer and, you know, talk about this. And I want to be commenting about, you know, regulatory policy and the FDA's decision for six month to four year old. I'm like, you know, I mean, you need to 
you need to read a little bit more if you want to be talking all this shit about like you don't know anything about drug regulation i don't you've never been in this business and yeah it's in the news and you want to comment as a doctor but you know you're just a follower you don't have any ideas you never you don't even know the rules of the game and so i don't know i think john gets all four and also it became fashionable to hate on him and that's where he is now he's stuck it's fashionable to hate on him and so people keep hating on him I just saw he just published that paper on Great Barrington Declaration. Go read the rapid responses. It's ridiculous. I mean, these people, they're just like hating on him, hating on him. One person was like, it's unethical to study people's publicly posted Twitter without IRB approval. I was like, no, it's not. It's publicly posted. That's not on. What are you talking about? No. Anyway. So, okay. So that's what I think. Four groups. Which group do you think is the largest? Followers. I think in this modern world, you know, in modern world, including among academics, the academics or followers. Yeah. You know what, Jacob, I'll tell you something messed up. I think that, you know, you're an academic, you're a, you're a law professor, and maybe it's a different type of than medicine, but let's say you took an average hemonc doctor. Okay. And you took an average hemonc doctor and you pulled an, a drug that they prescribe every day of their life. Okay. And you put a gun to their head and you said, tell me, why do you prescribe this drug? Tell me the trial. I don't think they can name the study. They can't name the author. They can't name what they showed in the trial. They can't name the result of the trial. They can't name any pitfalls of the trial. I think as much as we like to believe that we are practicing at the edge of scholarship, when you're a busy person, you have to make mental shortcuts. And those mental shortcuts, are you're gonna do what people around you do to fit into the herd. Um, and I think few of us really deeply interrogate our, our, our beliefs. Um, I think you do it and probably lawyers do it a lot more because it's part of your training, I think, to deeply interrogate why you believe what you believe. But maybe even some of them cheat, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you see it all the time with with law professors. And I, yeah, I've probably done this, but where it's like the, the media calls you, they want to quote on something and you want to be quoted. And so you read another article that some other media outlet wrote on it. And now you're an expert on that topic. And now you can be quoted on it because, and you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit because clearly you're bringing some domain specific expertise to it. But I think the way the typical reader reads a, 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 you know, a quote from someone talking about a case or something is that that person has really read all the filings in the case and has really followed it. Probably in, you know, half the time they've read a New York Times article about it and they're just making an assumption based on their knowledge. And I think, you know, because we, we now also, I think, reward, you know, reward that in academia, maybe more than doing, right? You're rewarded if your research gets buzzy and if you're quoted and if you have a lot of followers on, on Twitter. And maybe there were some good reasons for that, you know, getting outside the ivory tower, but it's, I think now the incentives are not, right? There was no incentive in the pandemic. Every, every, grand really round speaker is someone, make, yeah. every grand round speaker is someone who's tweeting about COVID, not someone who's actually working on COVID. Right. It's really, it's ridiculous. I've never seen, it's, they literally just go on Twitter and say, who do I invite to speak? But you're right. It creates the perverse incentive. You want to put your name out there. Um, right. But, you know, I got to say one thing about this being quoted in the newspaper. For the life of me, I never understood why anyone wants to do that because like, uh, I know some people in drug policy who've been quoted maybe 10,000 times over 20 years. But if I told you their names, you wouldn't even know who they are. Because when, as the reader, the reader doesn't see, like, if they want to build their own reputation, being quoted in someone else's article, it's not really a reputation builder. Nobody really, re I don't know, this is just my side, totally side yeah. tangent. If you want to build a reputation, I, you got to write the shit yourself. You know, I don't know. I think it might be that it's, I don't, I mean, I have no idea, but it might also be, I think it's exciting. And I think this maybe is part of the story of the, with, with some people in the pandemic, it's exciting to be like part of something that's happening in the real yes. world. Like you feel like you're in the ivory tower doing these theoretical things. And suddenly someone's like, what's your view on this important piece of social policy, you know, and now you get to be the expert who, right? I mean, I think this is the a, a structural problem with journalism where it's like, they need an expert voice. And one of the reasons people like to do it is suddenly, I, I saw this in law before, you know, the, something that always annoyed me in law was the notion that, um, that lawyers, that you should always call a law professor for comment on what some, uh, how some Supreme Court case that involves some deep constitutional issue should come out. Now, this is probably going to get me in trouble with some of the uh, con law folks. There are certainly things that people who study con law know that I don't know that might be relevant. But a lot of issues in the Constitution are, you know, what does the First Amendment mean? What are the limits of free speech? These are social issues. This is not something where someone who has studied and written on it has some incredible advantage. And we don't, it's not a vote of academics of what for the first amendment means. It's a societal conception. And I think this idea that you get to be the academic expert who speaks on something 
it's very exciting to people, but I think it creates this misleading perspective that like somehow a bunch of experts should decide it. There are clearly, I, I, this is not an anti-expert thing, but there are a lot of, of higher order judgments that can't just be the, the solely the application of one person applying expertise to a topic that they may not even know a lot about, but that's the way most media articles wind up getting written because you want the quote from the, uh, right? And then you want the quote from the person who's gonna say the most interesting thing. So you also tend to pick the most extreme voice and you know it quickly, so you pick the person who's on Twitter. So it's like a, a triply bad incentive on the media for, uh, for who gets quoted. Yeah, I read your essay. I agreed with every single word. And I don't know if we have a path out of the nightmare we're in, uh, both in COVID and also beyond COVID, because these issues are deep, they're deep structural issues with science and communication and expertise and uncertainty and crisis. And they are really, really tough issues. And if you pair that with, I mean, two things happen together, all these problems, and then this cancel culture, silence your opponent kind of culture of uh, intellectual weakness, they happen together. And the fact that they're happening together is very, very bad. And, and then the other force is wealth inequality and political polarization, and they're all overlapping into a Venn diagram of shit. And here we are stuck in the middle, <laughs> you know, I feel stuck in this. A, politi a political liberal who's always being told that he's on the hard right and funded by the Koch brothers, who I, I've never met and I've never been funded by the Koch. I've never been funded by anyone. Um, Just wait uh, till the end of this episode. They're going to, yeah, they're going to go. Your Chuck is in the mail. <laughs> funded by the Koch brothers. Uh, because of why? Because the guy who has always said for 20 years, uh, we need more randomized trials to prove things that they actually work, that he applied that same philosophy to masking kids, <laughs> you know, like, oh, oh, really went out, went in a different direction there asking for the randomized trials that he wrote a book about. And same for John asking for more data, better data, uh, totally different direction than he's always been. And, uh, and, and, say, and um, well, you know, that kind of thing. So I'll give you the last word on this topic. People should read the piece. The mask debacle, that's what it is. And it is not just the mask. It's its the entire, it's a metaphor for I think everything in COVID-19 and that's why it's so powerful. Can I make my last word a question to you? Because I actually, I have a, I have a philosophical question about, about what, so I mean, we've identified all of these different places where there has been a breakdown, you know, the, the way most people perceive other people as the, you know, the sort of psychological aspects of society you know, the, the way in which politicians cast uh, blame on people and made everything a problem for agencies to do. You've written about the, the failures of uh, uh, CDC and NIH with respect to research. We've talked about academic failures, the failure of Twitter, the failure of media. If you could take one, where do you think, if we wanted to make things better, if we wanted to not have this happen again, where do you think the best pressure point is, which one of those, so this is both who's the most responsible for it, okay. but also where is, where, where can you actually do something to fix it? Do you think it's, you know, is it something about academic culture? Is it, is it, is it the media? Do you have a, do you have a thought on sort of who, who let us down the most, who can, you know, prevent this from happening in the future? Just asking you to solve the world's problems. Yeah, no big deal. Uh, I'll give you my answer, but I want to know your answer. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, you know, the reason I'm not going to go towards social media, although I think it's a hellhole cesspool uh, that has problems, is that I think it's always going to be difficult to, 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 to you know, and people who, who think they always say that, like, well, there are these anti-vaxxers. There's always going to be a breadth of opinions out there and some and often will be crazy. People will always be crazy in every direction. You can't stop that. I think if I were to put a pinpoint on one thing, I would say that in a time of crisis, what Harvard should have done, what Hopkins should have done, what Stanford should have done is said, we are going to have real town halls. And a real town hall means that you don't like Jay Bhattacharya, you don't like John Unides, you don't like Martin Kulsdorf. Well, guess what? You're going to have to go toe to toe in an Oxford style debate, and we're going to post them online, and we're going to have many of these, not just some. We're going to just keep doing it, and you're going to be exposed to ideas you don't want. And I think that what it will really take is, I think, two part. One, you need leaders at those universities that got some, that got some courage. But also you need, I, I do think we have had a problem in, in universities, which is the dean doesn't have as much power as the dean used to. The dean can be fired like a whim. I bet if a hundred medical students here really had put their mind to it, they get the dean fired in an afternoon. And, and as much as I, as a student, sympathize with that, I didn't like the dean at the time, you know, as much as I sympathize with, you know, I think if you're gonna, if, you know, you can decide how you pick your dean, but the dean needs to have that power and that assurance that, no, that they are allowed to do these kinds of things and they will not be fired. And if people don't like it, you know, if the editor of JAMA approves a podcast that people don't like, and we think we live in a world where they can be fired on, you know, very quickly without anyone. And then the podcast redact, you know, nobody can even listen. Don't even know what the offense was. 
you know, that's not a world where leaders will want to use their leadership to be courageous. I mean, I think so. It takes two parts, courageous leaders and these kinds of things. That's my, that's my best solution because I think that's who I blame the most, maybe because I'm an academic. Who do you, how would you fix it? Since you took, I, I, I probably would say academia, but I think the other group that I'd put a lot of blame on as a former journalist is yeah. the mainstream press. I mean, I think both some of the things you just said about academia are true of the mainstream press, this, this sense that we have to satisfy our audience. And so therefore we have to go to extremes because our audience is going to get angry if we, you know, quote someone. So I, I, some of it is, I think, the same as academia. But I also think that the media has training and the strength and the ability to do two things that I think it has failed to do. One is to be skeptical and the other is to tell stories of how people are actually uh, uh, you know, coping with things. And I think a mix of, I think, especially it's gotten better, but I think particularly in the early days of the pandemic, I think a lot of people in the media felt bad that they had underplayed the pandemic. There was all the, you know, it's never going to come here. It's not going to be a big deal. It's just the flu. And I think they felt bad that they had, that they had done that. And so they overreacted and it was like, we're not going to interrogate anything anyone says. We're, we're, we're going to just report the party line, whatever, however you even determine that. Right. And we didn't get the kind of skeptical reporting that I think someone like David Zweig is doing. I mean, there's there's been a lot of reporting like that right. at all points because we need right. a skeptical press. And then I think um, the failure to tell stories, I mean, I think people were, I think people still are kind of unaware, but certainly early on, you know, what it's like for at a, at a preschool where all the kids are wearing masks at age two. I mean, I think these are human stories and you don't even have to tell it with a view to this no. needs to end. It's you're telling a story because your job as, as a journalist is to tell people stories. And I think we part of why we don't have empathy, um, and you see this, I mean, this, is, this was true pre-pandemic with I think the way a lot of, um, uh, I'm sure this on both sides, but since I mostly know um, other liberal people, the way liberals perceive Trump voters right. as a monolithic evil entity is partly right. because they don't, they don't know any of them and the media doesn't do a good job telling any stories. And so we wind up with no empathy, no ability to understand other people's motivations. And it it's even if you don't like what the other side is saying, it's just not helpful. It doesn't, it doesn't succeed in the end. So I'll say the media, even though all of my friends who are journalists will say it's it's tough being a journalist today. I get it. It's tough, but it's, tough. it's still their job. I'm reminded of the quote by Barry when she quit the New York Times, which is that the ultimate editor of the New York Times is Twitter. And I think that's part of it. Yeah. yeah. So, that's the sound of my car coming. I got to go somewhere. Well, pleasure to talk to you, Jacob Russ. I'm going to put this out on the web and right. hope a lot of people listen. Amazing article, Mass Debacle. People should read that and read your prior uh, op-eds throughout the pandemic on expertise. And I look forward to more to come. So until next oh, time. More to come. So yeah, thank you. Great to talk.